Well, thank you, Justin. So this was the outcome of a small seed grant from uh, the NSF Eager program. And I'd like to thank them for that. So our goals were um, multiple. Um, we wanted to create an upper level geophysics course that is based on the latest educational research. Um, and in particular, research shows that high quality pedagogy increases success of all students, uh, but particularly benefits students from underrepresented groups. And I, I, sorry, I forgot to put in the reference there. Um, so um, flipping a class or using active learning is um, been shown to particularly increase um, all student per, uh, performance, but particularly students from underrepresented groups. And we'd like to see this content offered as to off upper, level, upper level undergraduates as well as graduates, but in, we particularly focused on upper level undergraduates to reduce the leaky pipeline into geophysics graduate school. So our goal is partially to increase the confidence of upper level undergraduates that they can succeed in graduate school. We also want to reduce the time that pre and non-tenured faculty engage in class preparation. Uh, many of us have um, created our whole classes from scratch. And our idea is that if we had class templates and basically filled out classes that anyone can modify, then we don't spend as much time um, doing class preparation. We also wanted to create materials that non-seismologists could teach from and allow for flexible modality teaching. So this material could be used in person, in a hybrid situation, or in an online only um, classroom. So the content that we've developed is videos, written documents, and slides for derivations and theory. We've created homework with solutions, um, interactive multimedia PDFs linking seismotectonic observations, 16 lightboard lectures presenting mathematical background for seismologists in a, a geophysical context, 15 in-class real-time active learning exercises, and 13 interviews with seismologists from underrepresented groups featuring a variety of career paths and career stages. I will present a complete module on the elastodynamic equation as an example for what we could do with the seismology class. And this is for an advanced undergraduate or beginning level graduate class. Tolu will present whiteboard introductions to math concepts in a geophysical concept context, as well as online questions. Margaret will present an example lecture on heat flow and plate tectonics and show incorporation of interactive multimedia PDFs. And then Stephanie's um, work was to create assessments of the materials as well as YouTube videos of seismologists from underrepresented groups. And I will present for her because she unfortunately was not available today. So with that in mind, I'd like to start my um, section of the talk. And what I did is I've divided my seismology course up into many modules. And one of the modules is based on the elastodynamic equation. And we thought that was a good one to develop as part of this eager grant. So what I did is I looked at the flipped learning book by Robert Talbert, and I created a flipped class based on that. So I wrote down learning objectives and I sorted them into basic and advanced. The basic goals are those that I think students can absorb from reading or watching videos. And then the students would practice these with pre-class exercises. 
And the pre-class exercises then also gives me as the teacher uh, insight into what they're struggling with and what they get. And then I can go into any concepts that they're struggling with in class. And then advanced goals are higher in Bloom's taxonomy and we devote class time to working on them. These are due as homework or presented as in-class exercises. Little class time is actually devoted to lecture. Really, I wanted to devote the class time to um, in-class exercises or students working together on homework and group work is encouraged. However, that said, you could take the slides that I've presented or that I, I will make available and use that as part of a traditional lecture course. So each module of the course is on Overleaf and here is just an example. Um, I give an overview, I give learning goals, which is sort of the broad goal of each module. And then I list the learning objectives in terms of basic and advanced. And this is just for the elastodynamic equation. There are actually um, some other learning goals for this module, but I haven't presented them here. And then I also present activities. So um, day one, for instance, in class, we have before class exercises and in class exercises. And then I list all the resources available to students and then their assignments um, that are due. The content I've created for the elastodynamic module is an overview of learning goals, assignments, and reading videos that which I just showed you a 24 page step-by-step -step description of the derivation of the elastodynamic equation. So this compares to like one or two pages in the Stein and Weiss session book, which we use. So I go through things um, in very careful detail and I present a lot of sort of skip steps that uh, Stein and Weiss session um, did, did not do. I also have included an 18 page write up of spherical wave propagation that I include in this module, as well as a review of what we've covered in class so far. So this includes all past lectures. Um, this is module six. So there are modules one through five and I just do a brief summary of all those. I have created five short six to 12 minute long videos so students could either do the reading, they could watch the videos, or um, the instructor can lecture in class um, from the PowerPoint slides that I provide. And then there are two sets of pre-class questions with keys. There's homework and keys, and then there is an in-class exercise and key. So an example of pre-class exercise, um, here is uh, my day one pre-class exercise. And this is based on summation notation. And so in previous parts of the class, we've gone through summation notation, but I've found that it's useful to make sure that students really understand it. And then that they write equations that are relevant to the current learning goals. So I have three equations here that I asked them to write out all the terms because these are in summation notation. Um, I also asked them to write out E sub one, two, the, uh, the strain tensor in terms of U, the deformation vector and X, the location vector. And then list the three assumptions that we made in deriv deriving the elastodynamic equation. And then for in-class questions, um, I base this on my experience. Um, one, one of the in-class questions is I give them a P wave potential, a scalar potential, and then I ask them to calculate the P wave displacement. So 
it emphasized that the P wave displacement is the gradient of the P wave potential. This is something that I found it, it takes a little while for students to kind of understand. And I've also found that it's useful to have them actually do the calculus involved. Um, some students um, still struggle to do sort of the, um, the math, um, even though they've had vector calculus before. So I've, I found this to be useful. And then the students will get together in a group and present each in-class exercise question to the other students. And then the homework question, here's an example homework question, and this is actually from Stein and my session. Um, I won't read it out to you, but this particular homework question gives practice in students calculating the strain tensor. So it, it, it kind of, um, moves up a little bit in Bloom's taxonomy in terms of the students have to think about what the strain tensor is before they can actually do this calculation. And here's an example video. I just want to show you a minute of it. We just got done relating force to the spatial variation and stress. Our next step will be to relate force to displacement. So we're going to start with Newton's second law, so force equals mass times acceleration. And in our case, rather than A for acceleration, we're going to use the second time derivative of displacement, and we use U for displacement. I'm just going to write it as U dot dot, which is shorthand for the partial derivative, second partial derivative of U with respect to T. Mass is just represented as density times volume. And in case of our infinitesimal element, it's rho density times dx1, dx2, dx3. Now we have two relationships that are equal to force. We have the spatial variation in stress, and we have, which is this right here, and now we have mass times acceleration here. So hopefully that will give you an example of some of the videos that I've made available. And obviously this video was from um, a series of videos. So it just kind of jumped right into things, but uh, the, the previous video gives a good introduction to elastodynamics. And then uh, plans for the future. Um, I taught a course using standards based grading this semester, and it was really successful. So I want to add standards based grading to my seismology course and then make that material available as well. All right, and now it, I will hand it over to Tolu. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, I'll share my screen. <clears throat> Hopefully you can all see my screen and let's uh, power that up. Um, okay, so I will give um, a brief discussion on these tools uh, that we've provided. These are light boards and polls, so online in-class questions. But before I proceed, I just wanted to remind us uh, what these are good for. So why light boards and why poles, what they are, and the products um, that we'll be providing, which I'll describe in the next few slides. So why light boards and poles? Well, the goals is for us to teach better and to help students learn better. What are they? Uh, they're just tools and technologies that help us do that, teach better, and learn better. It's important to realize that there are tools and technologies and that we have to, again, borrow from a lot of research in education, uh, educational research, how we can teach better, how to use those tools and technologies. So it's very important to remember that. And in the next few slides, I'll give examples of uh, the 16 Lightboard lectures we've done. Obviously, I'm not gonna give all of them, just some snapshots of those. 
and examples of poles. Okay, so what are light boards? Um, in the middle image here, you see me giving a lecture uh, to an audience. Uh, this could be any one of you uh, uh, teaching a class. Um, the thing that makes teaching um, awesome is you can look at the audience and you can engage with the audience. And that's what I'm showing here with me as well, talking to some students where they are looking at me and engaging with me. Light boards, uh, therefore, are just a teaching and learning aid that helps us do mathematical anal analysis without turning our back to the audience. So I am engaging with the audience, the, the audience is engaging with me, and I am uh, doing analysis um, while uh, maintaining that engagement. That's kind of the general goal uh, of light boards. They're not easy to do. Um, oftentimes you need uh, to have a studio uh, to do that, but they're not expensive. In my case here at the University of Rochester, um, we had uh, we have a, a, you know a light board studio in house. Most universities have them. Uh, most departments of education and um, technology have them, uh, and they're not they're not very costly. So in these first two images here, you're seeing me in front of that light board, and there's a camera that I'm facing, and that camera uh, has a mirror that flips whatever is on the board to make it look like. Uh, uh, what you see in that last image. They're very useful uh, for, for doing flipped classes. Uh, again, like I said, it's useful to engage with learners that are visual uh, because they can look at the material, they can look at the professor while the professor is uh, doing uh, mathematical analysis. So light boards are a face forward studio quality recording that helps you uh, to provide resources that engage the audience. Okay. What, do, uh, what does the current collection uh, contain? Um, like we said, like I said, like 16 uh, light board lectures, uh, things like complex numbers, introduction to complex numbers, uh, algebra and vectors, linear algebra and matrix algebra, important uh, things like coordinate transformations, Einstein notations, vector calculus, uh, that help you understand tensors and things like wave equation. Again, the idea is to provide resources that faculty, new faculty can use, old faculty can, can review, um, uh, that provide a mathematical minimum for students who are taking courses in the geosciences. So I, I've called them the mathematical minimum or mathematical foundation. You're gonna, take, you know, you're gonna be taking a course in Solid, solid earth geophysics, applied geophysics, seismology, beat exploration, exploration of global seismology, geodynamics, data analysis, machine learning, signal processing, observational seismology. These are the collection of mathematical uh, 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 foundations you need to have. Oftentimes it's hard to find them in one uh, particular place. And when you have developing through classrooms or uh, wanting notes uh, to reuse, it's hard to find them and uh, that's why uh, we provided them, we developed them thanks to NSF. Okay, where can it be found? Uh, right now, if you go to that link right there, uh, you, would, you, will find, you will find them. Uh, this is an example uh, of a snapshot in about an 11 minute video where I'm going over uh, complex numbers from a geometrical uh, perspective perspective. We've got the imaginary uh, axis I, and then the real axis there um, on the horizontal. And I, I start by telling the students, okay, you've got a number, a real number two, you multiply by itself. Uh, what happens to the real number? Well, the real number jumps to the right of the real axis and keeps going on and on and on on the right of the, of the real axis. Then I ask them, okay, how about this, this number I? You take a real number and you multiply by I, and what happens is you join from you, you jump from the real axis to the imaginary axis, and you keep doing that over and over again, and you see i become minus one, i become minus i, and on and on. And this notion of i as a number that has rotation on a two-dimensional plane emerges. So giving the students intuition, um, gentle introduction to concepts in complex numbers, and a couple other lectures in that set. Now, the goal here is that the content is decidedly earth science focused. Um, as, an, as a graduate student myself, um, the question, the, 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 
the concern is that oftentimes, you know, you, you take a class in the math department or even the physics department, department, and the goal is always doing math for math's sake. Why am I learning divergence, curl, and grad? Why do I need that? Here, instead of just giving you the tools, we'll just come back to the issue. The issue is you want to learn about seismic wave equation, right? And uh, let's just start from there. Let's start from the seismic wave equation. Let's start from a displacement vector field. Let's start from ground vibrations. Let's write out the seismic wave equation in all its beauty and its majesty and its glory. And let's go and decompose it. What is this upside down triangle? What is this uh, notation? What is this operator? And let's begin from there. So we're, we're, we're giving uh, <clears throat> mathematical foundations, but the content, the driver, the motivation is earth science focused. That's just to emphasize that all of these courses uh, have that flavor. All of these uh, light board lectures have that flavor. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what it is. Yeah, I'm just giving you another example, right? Uh, you want to recruit students uh, from a broader audience into uh, the geophysics major. You want students from underrepresented minorities uh, uh, to come to a, say, a general introductory class, but uh, appreciate um, the quantitative nature of the earth sciences. Or even in fact, you want students uh, to uh, take from taking an, a general introduction class to take more advanced lecture classes. This is one example that does that. So the question some students may ask me is, what does calculus have to do with nature's fury? What does calculus have to do with natural hazards? What does calculus have to do uh, with understanding how Earth operates and its impact on human society? Here, I'm, I'm showing you a, a snapshot in a lecture where we are taking, we are using nature's free to understand gradients, right? The notation is you've got this uh, Dell operator. Um, you can, you now know how to do grad, uh, to take gradients of fields, uh, scalar fields. I introduced them in this sketch of a scalar field, which is a pressure field somewhere around Australia and New Zealand. Uh, they know about contours, um, uh, lines of constant pressure, lines of constant scalar value. And then I uh, match the notation. You take the gradient of a pressure field. This is the driving force, which, which, which we call winds, uh, which now explains severe weather. So now they know the connection between uh, calculus and the way the Earth operates. Just another example. Okay, so those are light boards. Uh, I'm giving you uh, uh, what light boards are. I give you some examples in that uh, collection set that we've made available, uh, uh, courtesy of NSF. Um, we'll, here in the next two or three slides, I'll be talking about polls. Uh, why would you want to do you uh, use polls for teaching better? What are they? And the case is that students learn better when they are actively learning and not just sitting down and hearing the professor go on and on and on. So uh, research suggests that when students are learning actively and when you design your assessments that promote active learning from your stated goals, so doing backward designs uh, and incorporate that into your lectures, uh, the students will learn better. You'll also teach better. Students love to engage and sometimes in fact, they love to compete. They want to know what the other student next to them is thinking about the particular question. And if uh, this is done uh, actively, <clears throat> if this is done actively, uh, it helps uh, the student learn better. And this is an example of a slide uh, showing that. So instead of me just writing up an equation, I, mean, I just show them a seismogram. I show them measures on that seismogram, time, amplitude, and, um, and pose it as a question, you know, if the time increases or the amplitude stays the same, what happens to the magnitude? You've got a couple of options, students bring in their phone and they in real time choose the options. And I see that the responses and the whole class as well. So, you know, I love instead of describing things to just show and tell, you know, I just show a map uh, of tsunami uh, propagation times I tell them what that map is and I ask a question. Rank the arrival from early to late on when that tsunami from Chile uh, will get to a particular location on the Earth's surface. Students can respond. They love to respond. Students can learn. They love to learn. Students can give feedback. 
feedback on misconceptions. We can discuss those mis misconceptions. The classroom is engaged. We're teaching better. We're learning better. This is in, in this particular case powered by the Poll Everywhere software. Uh, there are free subscriptions um, and uh, not too expensive academic subscri subscriptions as well. Um, in our case, due to COVID uh, at the University of Rochester, the university provided uh, has provided now um, uh, a university-wide subscription. Okay, so you know ex there's a, you need experience to uh, de to um, define questions, very simple questions that improve uh, students' skills in observation, in app in interpretation, in applying the concepts that they have just learned in class. So this is not uh, meant to be deep analysis that takes a lot of time. This is just okay. Observe, interpret, and just apply what you've learned right now, maybe in the in the previous slides, in current slides, or in slides to come. This again, like we said, like I said, provides real time assessment. Am I teaching well? Are the students learning what I want them to learn? Are they retaining it? And is this particular concept difficult? And should I explain it differently? Should I spend more time developing more resources to help them understand difficult concepts? Uh, this is a selection of uh, different ways you can pose questions. And as you can see in each of these particular uh, online class, uh, online uh, slides, you can include animations, pictures, graphs, maps, um, a whole uh, spectrum of uh, resources that allow you to show, tell, and do these assessments. I'll stop there uh, and uh, hand over to Margaret. Great. Um, thank you so much, Joe. Can everyone see okay? Yep. Okay, super. Okay. Um, great. So one of the things you're going to see and that we've seen so far is this um, is this common thread of mathematical geophysics and and the the importance of of incorporating math in a found as a you know as a strong as a foundation in geophysics and um, and how that's so essential for training the next generation of geoscientists. And so one of the things I did in my module in my portion is um, I sort of wrapped the mathematical geophysics in terms of process. Um, in in where I was building on existing frameworks and also leveraging new technologies with interactive digital products. And so specifically, what does that mean? There are two um, specific contributions. One is a, a module on the life cycle of an oceanic plate. And then second is this uh, collection of, of clickable interactive multimedia PDFs. And these, uh, these multimedia PDFs are gonna be embedded in module one, which I'm gonna go over to now, but they also are available standalone too. And so in terms of the, uh, the module, like a, um, in terms of the life cycle of an oceanic plate. So I frame that in uh, three parts, just the seafloor sea spreading and the formation of oceanic atmosphere, uh, like the basically once the plate becomes a plate and how you identify a plate. And then, um, then the sort of the end of the life of the oceanic plate in terms of oceanic plate consumption into the asthenosphere. And these are all concepts or parts of the process that at the first glance, everyone's sort of like, we know this, students might be like, we know this. But when you look more deeply, we find that there's a lot of nuances that we, that we don't quite understand, or there's sort of assumptions that we think we know what these pieces are of this process, but we don't quite fully appreciate actually the, the details. And so um, in terms of this, this module, like the product, so the module is comprised of a set of, of 61 PDF slides on the life cycle of the oceanic plate. The slides are done with, uh, with tech and so Beamer, which is really great for equations. Um, and then the multimedia PDFs, the, these are useful to intuitively query subduction zones. Um, there's a MATLAB code that goes with this comparing the half space and plate cooling models. And the slides and PDFs are available. You can get them on my website and, um, and also um, on UV Box, which you can get through my website as well. Um, and so I'm gonna go over just a little bit of each of these parts, like part one, two, and three, in terms of that life cycle of the oceanic plate from sort of creation to sort of formation and then the, the kind of consumption. And in this, there's a couple processes that stand out that are common, like that still are not quite appreciated in, in upper 
in upper level geophysics is the idea of a plate being comprised of both the crust and then mantle lithosphere. And so although the oceanic crust remains relatively constant through it, the life cycle of the oceanic plate, it's that mantle lithosphere part that is thickening with time. And this gets in the concept of treating the outer layer of the earth as a thermal boundary layer. And um, so a lot of part one, I'm leveraging on the chapter four and heat transfer from Turcotte and Schubert. And, um, and as you can see that that chapter's got 272 equations in the 2014 version. And you start at Fourier's law in equation one, but you don't get to the half space cooling model to equation four, 125. And so, and, and um, that's sort of, that's as anyone who's taught that it, there's many wonderful things in that, in that book, but in that chapter, but uh, you can actually follow this sort of this evolution from Fourier's law to the formation of the, you know, the lithosphere as a thermal boundary layer by kind of going from different sections and following that mathematical thread. And I'll show you that in a second. But before we go through in, in, the, in this part of the lecture where I'd be setting up all these equations and, and filling in the blanks, I, I leveraged some um, observations and digital products to uh, sort of get the students engaged and interested before you have like, you know, several lectures, just all of equations. And, um, and so for example, this is, this is one of the clickable PDFs. This is available, it's fully cited. We're using the Seafloor Age Grid, the 2020-2019. And that's these click, these um, hot links on the bottom take you to the papers. It's the Demet's plate boundaries that takes you. There's the Hayes slabs here. Uh, that um, again, that citation for that, and then it's hidden. But there's the this um, the slab geometries that we're about to see are also in Jadamic at all 2018. So we have. So how is this this clickable multimedia PDF? So one of the reasons I did the presentation in Beamer today was because it's a PDF. And so how you do it is you click on that subduction zone. Literally anyone can do it. These are available, and then it takes you to these published movies showing the. Um, the uh, the geometry of of that subduction zone in in a movie, and so the students can look at that clickable PDF and just go right to these these movie visualizations and um and so you can query all along, along the, the subduction zones and, and it's and it connects to those different movies and they are they're on Panopto so like literally this anyone can grab it they're on my website right now and so this is a nice sort of introduction because we can look at these observations in terms of the concept of this oceanic seafloor being um, recycled um, we can see that by the young ages that of course the age of the earth is over four billion years old but the oceanic lithosphere is you know not much older than 200 million and so it's this concept of this life cycle and it being recycled and so then so we start that way with these interactive pds which students can query it's pretty fun and they can look at those realistic geometries and then then it starts with Fourier's law and again i just I basically coded up all the equations following from Fourier's law into following the thread through the different sections in the book to get you like filling in steps <laughs> with this, you know, dummy variables, variables integration, um, different math steps along the way to ultimately get you to the half space cooling model. And then, um, and so all those are coded up and, and the, the numbers are like uh, the correspond, I did the reset for the counting. So all the numbers correspond to the numbers in Turk country for 2014. So anyone that's great. I, I don't know, I've gone through this a million times. And so it was really useful to have it all coded up in Beamer. Anyone can get these tech versions of these. Um, and then there's a MATLAB code that goes with it where I explored, this is just the half space cooling model for different ages of lithosphere, but then I flipped it around. You can pull out different isotherms. We should probably also include the 1350 isotherm, but you can pull out isotherms and then put it around as like for a range of ages, what would the depth to the lithosphere, the base of the lithosphere be? And again, this is useful because well, as we can see for older ages, it gets quite deep, which is being over predicted by the half space cooling model. You could also flip it around and just plot it in terms of for these isotherms for depth versus age. And that kind of more intuitively gives you the sense of just like a warming, you know, the lithosphere, the base of the lithosphere. And then you could go ahead and Plot that, again, I did the same thing for the plate cooling model. So these are the isotherms for the plate cooling model. Um, and then you could do compare them for the different isotherms for plate cooling model versus half space cooling model. And then, and then look at that difference. And again, we can see that 
um, after about 45, 50 million years, the, the half space coil model over predicts. And so that gets to these questions of like the, the treating the lithosphere as a thermal boundary layer, and then what that implies for, um, you know, questions, why is it that we don't keep thickening the oceanic lithosphere, for example. And then, what, so we've made a plate, great. And now what happens, like what is a tectonic plate? Again, we take it for granted, but here's this, again, this clickable PDF, but now here we've got the Nouvelle pl uh, plate boundaries plotted. And again, and this is with seafloor in the background, you can also plot the more recent topography and bathymetry. And one of the things that kind of stands out is yes, a plate can be entirely oceanic lithosphere, but a plate is really this kinematic rheologic construct that can have continental and oceanic lithosphere. And so this sort of highlights that concept. You can see the continental shelf there in, in, in uh, pink. And again, with this, this North American plate having continental and oceanic lithosphere. And then, so in terms of that composition, you can see that, but then again, one, again, plates as this kinematic rheologic construct, you could go ahead to the plate, uh, the bird plate boundary model, we have 52, on the order of 52 plates. And again, now we have these, those plotted here. And so, um, you can see what what this emphasizes just the fact for the Earth of the scale dependence for at what scale is a plate plate like and that might depend on the problem or what you're trying to address and then there's discussion questions that kind of go around those concepts and um, and then lastly the plate then is consumed and again we come back to the clickable PDFs and again we take it for granted we see what happens you know we we have the sense of we're so you know of the of the trenches and the plates on the Earth's surface. But what, what does it look like when they actually descend into the Earth's interior? And the Alaska situation is so complicated, but it's relatively more straightforward than somewhere like Southwest Pacific. Here, as you can see, Banda, and then you could get Salawasi, all these other uh, complicated interacting uh, slab geometries at depth. And so this then just brings the, the, the three-dimensionality to this sense of the life cycle of an oceanic plate. And it makes the interior of the earth less of a black box because here's what happens when the slabs go inside. And so, and these are all cited, these are published, uh, those movies. And so, um, and then again, you can see them here is, here's the list. There's actually 16 movies that go, this is, they're in this paper. I've just linked them with this clickable PDF and, um, and then you can also download all those movies yourself of the slab geometries from the UB Institutional Repository or stream them. I have those on Panopto as well. And then, so in terms of the concept then of this life cycle of the oceanic plate, so then we've consumed it, we've gone into the Earth's interior. And then again, the slabs they, in, real, in real life, they, they're curved. What does that imply for the rheology? They're discontinuous. What does that imply for the dynamics? And then they're locally stirring the, the, the mantle, the asthenosphere into which they're descending. And then the life cycle of the oceanic plate continues over again. And so that is in that sort of process, we've framed this like, life cycle of the oceanic plate, but leveraged a ton of math and kind of moved from this 2D to a three-dimensional paradigm thinking about subduction. And again, the slide, the, the, the module, like the 61 set slide set for the life cycle of the oceanic plate, you can get here. And then I also just put those clickable PDFs with the slab geometries with the seafloor atrid and topography bathymetry base as just separate standalone ones. Anyone can use them, they're available, they're fully cited. You click on the paper, on the, the PDFs and you can get all the observations that are plotted. And um, and so that's that's the, what I wanted to share. So Derek, we'll turn it back over to you. All right. Okay. I would like to share with you what uh, Stephanie has done. Um, one thing that she's done um, in collaboration with me, um, we created a bunch of short YouTube videos where we interview um, seismologists from diverse backgrounds and have them share their experiences. We hired undergraduate students from um, underrepresented groups um, up in the upper right here, we see one of the students. And then I, I also hired Ciela Martos um, to conduct the interviews and edit the videos. So they basically did most of the work. And the interviews feature people of color, first-generation college student, 
and those from socioeconomically and disadvantaged backgrounds. So um, our videos range from two to 15 minutes, so they can easily be used within a classroom setting or as a as homework module. The interviews feature geoscientists within different fields, so academia, government, industry, et cetera, and all different career levels. Some of the interviews are also conducted partially in Spanish, so we can use them as well for our Spanish speaking students. And there are playlists on YouTube. So here's an example. You know, I, I originally chose geology and I kind of fell into seismology by accident. Um, I was lucky enough to get a what's called a Keck geology uh, internship while I was an undergraduate at the University of Texas at El Paso. And that um, undergraduate research opportunity took me to Costa Rica, where I met a very vibrant and <laughs> exciting seismologist. Um, he is the head of um, Costa Rica's what Oviscori Una, which is their uh, national um, seismic observatory. And he, uh, on, on, as a part of that undergraduate research opportunity, he was deploying seismometers on the coast of uh, Costa Rica's Nicoya Peninsula. And I, I don't know, I just got really excited about it. You know, there was, um, I got to see a lot of cool instrumentation. They still had, um, back then they had, they still had the machines that would actually record um, uh, the waveforms on paper on the, on the seismic drums and stuff. So, you know, it was just really exciting seeing all that stuff. And um, I saw, he, you know, he was also Hispanic as I was, and I was, you know, kind of inspired to uh, just explore what seismology was and it just kind of went from there. Um, and, he... and here's one more. That's a useful. Like, I think, um... You know, I'm speaking as as a, a gender minority, as a racial minority, and also like socioeconomic. Uh, you know, I I um I would say I've encountered a lot of barriers. Um, probably the biggest one that I've encountered in geophysics or seismology is just um, not being around much diversity and. That particularly impacted me during my PhD when I think the sense of community mattered the most, you know, for resilience and, and um, you know, to keep going. Because getting a PhD is quite a difficult thing to do. And I think a lot of people were able to find community. Um, and I struggled to find my community. Um, so our Video topics included um, how the interviewees chose the discipline of seismology, um, discussion of their academic and career path, um, experience with barriers and hurdles, and also advice for students interested in the discipline. And our, our goal is partially just to give students who may be from underrepresented groups in our classes the picture of seismology as a more diverse field. So another thing that Stephanie has worked on is creating a rubric to evaluate our course content. So we have based it on the integrate material development and refinement rubric. And there are six sub areas of the rubric, guiding principles, learning objectives and goals, assessment and measurement, resources and materials, instructional strategies and alignment. So example questions that we have created in terms of 
these um, subfields of the rubric. For instance, the guiding principles we've had, the, does the module make use of authentic and credible seismological data to learn central concepts in the context of geoscience methods of inquiry? Or in terms of the resources and materials, are the instructional materials sufficiently diverse and at the depth necessary for students to achieve learning goals and outcomes? And our goal is to rate um, each um, content as from zero to three points, and then try to uh, reach a, a minimum point level for each content or else revise the content so that we can uh, reach this minimum point level. So right now we've modified the original integrate rubric and used it to help guide the development of our course materials. And we are currently doing peer review of materials within our author group. And what we would like to do is share resources with others who are interested and then make modifications based on feedback and suggestions. And then once that is done, we wanna make the resources more widely available. I think all of us are um, happy to share materials um, either through the links that have been given or just through email. So just feel free to email us. Um, but then once they've been evaluated, hopefully we will make it available on the IRIS website. And then we would like to have discussion board type interactions about module resources and implementation. So once we've done that, and we, we'd like to learn more about community needs, um, and then we would like to write a follow-up proposal to fund development of a full upper level class or classes um, with full community input. So for instance, uh, a person would take charge of an individual module and then we would fund um, say 10 different modules to cover a whole course. And then we would do evaluation of the material and that would be different from, for instance, what CERC does, which is also excellent um, in that, that we would make a whole course available with keys, with tests, with assessments and so on. All right, thanks everyone. And uh, I'll hand it over to Justin now. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, thanks, thanks to you and Tolu and, and Margaret for those uh, wonderful presentation. We've had a, um, a couple questions uh, that have come up so far, but those of you tuning in uh, out there in the audience, if you had some questions, please feel free to uh, type those into the Q&A box and you can send those in. I'll go ahead and read this first question. Um, Derek, I think this one was directed at you for, um, for your, your uh, slides at the beginning of today's talk. And uh, Joshua writes, can you talk a bit uh, more about your experience with standards-based grading? What does it entail and in what ways did you find it to be more successful? So the, there's a drive among um, different communities to create alternative grading. And there are people who are doing ungrading and I took a more conservative approach and I use standards-based grading. So what I did is I, this was in my intro to geophysics class of a bunch of sophomores. And I created nine learning goals that I wanted to assess the students on. And I created um, seven assessments with each of those learning goals on them after they were presented in class. And I gave students four or five times to achieve each learning objective. So rather than give them a test in class uh, every week or every other week, I would give them a take home assessment and they would be able to show me whether or not they could achieve the learning objectives. And students really liked it because they, they struggled, um, especially the first couple learning objectives where we looked at triple junction stability and relative plate motion and gravity corrections. Um, students struggled to, to get that the first time, 
but they had multiple opportunities and in a low stress environment to show me that they were able to do the material. So um, the students by and large said it was, uh, they really liked the assessments. And so I'm going to keep doing this and I'm going to add them to my seismology class. Excellent, that sounds great. Um, I had a question for, for Tolu. This is maybe just exposing some of my ignorance here, but I thought those light boards that you were demonstrating were just the coolest thing. Uh, I, I really love the way that it allows you to remain kind of like face to face and engaged with the students um, as you're doing, you know, an analysis on the board. But I couldn't quite figure out um, like the logistics of how that works. So like if you're standing on the other side of the board, do you have to learn to write backwards from your perspective oh, no. so that it looks forward? Like how did how does that part play? Uh, so that's th thanks for that question. Um, uh, just like you, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, cool. This is just like the Matrix. It's like super cool. Yeah. Any, other, <laughs> any other Hollywood movie you see with some nerd uh, writing on the board, but it's actually if, if analog. It's so analog, it's unreal. <clears throat> you have, you've got a camera facing the light board and you literally just have a mirror angled 45 degrees in such a way that between the light board and the, and the camera, the, the flip is implemented. So okay. that's all it is. Now you can obviously do the, 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 the flip in, in software. Uh, uh -huh. I can do, you, you can do the flip in software, but then that just is another extra software thing. Uh, most, most software recordings can do the flip in real time. Uh, as, as you're doing that. So you don't read, I, I don't learn to write backwards. Like, that's what I thought. I was like, whoa, um, that's really and some people, <laughs> And some, and some um, schools have it all set up where in their big lectures, they have a little tiny side um, uh, professor wide light board that he can just sit and then uh -huh. they do the flip in real time and then they see it on the, on the display. Okay. So it's, it's very, in, in our case at University of Rochester, we, we have two, two sets, there's the cheaper set which I'm sure with the budget of say $5,000 to $7,000 and the space itself, you can get a light board studio running. Okay. Um, so it's, it's that cheap, you know, just a light board, uh, obviously some lights, it, you know, something to make sure the, you, you got like a, a curtain at the back so that, you know, mm -hmm. you, don't got, you don't have reflection and a $500 camera with a mirror and, and, and you're in business. Uh, the way I use it, though, I think is uh, in my case, for example, I teach a data analysis class. Well, one of the ways I use is I teach a data analysis class and students often come with a weak background in linear algebra. But the course is really a skills based course. We're actually write, writing code all the time, every time in class. Um, obviously, I also do a, uh, discussions with my with my PowerPoint slides. Uh, but then I, the students need to review, OK, how do I do column row operation? What does that mean? What are null spaces? All these important mathematical uh, concepts to have as you as you are doing uh, data analysis. But I don't want to go over it again. Uh, I have them watch it at their free time. I incorporate assessments while I'm teaching lecture to make sure that they are watching it. And obviously, I can tell how many people watch it. I can go back because they are Panopto videos. I'm going to actually see: Are you watching it? Are you watching it all the way to the end? Which ones are you watching? I, you know, blah blah blah, and that gives me a sense of of how the students are are using the resource. For for me, also, it's like just good notes. That's a permanent notes book that mm -hmm. I have. So I, I I actually watch myself give lectures and say, okay, oh, this is what I this is what I want to say in class. This is what I want to highlight in class, and it's a permanent it's a permanent thing. When it's done, it's done. It takes a yeah. lot of work to do them, uh, but when it's done, it's done. Yeah. Great. Uh, maybe this next question I can direct towards Margaret. Um, you know, I I, uh, I really appreciated the, the portion of your your presentation where you were talking about kind of a lot of the nuance that's involved in some of these concepts. And your example, you were talking about sort of the oceanic crust and the lithosphere. Um, I'm curious, you know, John Tabor sent in a question that I thought maybe I'd, I'd pitch to you, uh, Margaret, about. It, it, has the group kind of gotten together to talk about like a recommended sequence for the use of the materials that have been created or are these also supposed to be kind of independent and within each independent set that each of you has already kind of put that thought into it or they can be shuffled around and, and moved however 
however people would like to present them. Yeah, what, so so um, so this was like, we each had about a week of funding or so, and some of the work we had done prior, and then we used that time to formalize sort of directions that we were sort of going in. But with the goal, we had identified basically a semester long course with upper level geophysics. Some of it could swap back between seismology or geodynamics or some of the data analysis, because there's this like, there was the common thread of like reviewing the mathematical geophysics part, but then also leveraging technologies. And so, the, so we each, thinking about a full semester, long course, we each took sort of a, a, a module of that. And so our goal is then to, um, to, you know, this was like a proof of concept type of type of work. And so, and then um, the goal is to, as you know, as Derek had indicated, to put back, you know, to put in a longer proposal and get mm -hmm. more community feedback and have a full course. And at that point, um, I mean, we would have modules in order, but I would think, but the, also the idea is that some of the modules can just be interchange, interchangeable between other courses. Because like, I also, like, you know, Derek had, all, uh, sorry, Atolu had also mentioned a data analysis. Like I also use this in geodynamics and like also in uh, the tectonics part of a structure tectonics course. There's so many upper level geophysics courses that someone might want one of these modules. Like maybe someone doesn't want to code up all the like equations in Turcotte Schubert to do that heat flow, you know, the, the, sorry, the you know, plate, you know, you know, plate cooling model thread but but yet there's lots of different courses that might want to use that and so the idea is to have it yes as like a one sort of coherent class but yet at the same time have it modular and that people can can use pieces of them as well okay yeah Derek and, and Tolu I don't know if either one of you have any if you want to jump in on that anything about kind of the recommended yeah, so, sequence yeah so recommended sequence everything Margaret said is on point again the idea is this was a proof of concept um, we, we had one or two modules highlighted, uh, but the goal is to have a proposal written where we have a, com a complete course. Uh, mm -hmm. But even as we com communicate with the community, we might have some, uh, I don't know, maybe network diagram of how modules can be interchanged for a particular uh, use case, for example. Mm -hmm. So in this case, a use case of data analysis, okay or let's say signal processing, which is a course I'll be teaching next, seismology and signals. Oh, let's learn a little bit of complex numbers. Let's learn a little bit of vectors. Let's learn a little bit of linear algebra before we dive into those. But that's uh, a way to think about how this might be used going forward. But we again, we are open to uh, uh, yeah, input from the community on how this might be developed uh, in the context of what we have now, but also what we plan to do later. Okay. Yeah. That raises a question for me that I think is somewhat related to, to uh, Stephanie's slide that Derek spoke to at the towards the end of the presentation, and that is, you know, um, an about kind of having an evaluation and feedback mechanism in place. I'm curious, how, is tracking just just usage of these model modules part of that? I mean, you guys, a lot of these materials have been made freely available, and you're putting them on the website, and people can. And access them. Are you asking folks to to check in with you, or do you have any way of tracking so that you can get some sense of who's using them and for what purpose and and that kind of thing? Or is it all just self reported? You're just it's, you're relying on on people who use this to to check in with you and tell tell you what they thought. Yeah, I I don't know if we've actually thought about that. Um, partially, just because this is a a seed idea. And we, we haven't completely, you know, created the, the courses that we would like to do. But uh, certainly it would be interesting, at least informally, to get a sense for um, who's using our content now and who, who will be using our content as we make it more available. Yeah. Yeah, the the um, the slab movies that I have, those were, were the ones like the clickable PDFs click to them, but those were published, you know, in 2018 with Earth and Space Science. I just by putting them on the clickable PDF, it's more intuitive to get to them. Mm -hmm. But that those are the those are actually available for download at the UB Institutional Repository, and they actually do track site oh, you know okay. downloads for the for those movies. But um, but yeah, it's something that as we go forward, we'd like to we would like to do. Um, but again, that would be like one of the next steps. Yeah. In terms of principles, though, yeah, most certainly the users are um, the faculty who might be using this. Uh, we want them to be reviewed before we finally publish them um, or reviewed some, you know, some kind of 
peer review in that sense. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, there might be little tiny errors, uh, ways to get feedback uh, on, on little errors. So if you need to have an errat, errata uh, mm -hmm. published alongside a resource, and then just um, you know, which, which materials are hot, which materials yeah. are uh, people like going to over and over again. That can give you a sense of need for that or just uh, value of, of, of that particular module. Principles, uh, how we're doing it now, we, we don't, as like Derek says, still open, but we'll, we'll probably discuss it. Okay. Maybe just one final question before we go. Uh, James had written in, I think told this one, that this one's directed towards you. Um, since you mentioned that the light board helps facilitate interaction with students because you're facing them, but wouldn't it also inhibit that somewhat by putting a barrier between you and the students? I mean, can, are you able to actually see the students because it's like a clear, clear board or how, how does that work in, in terms of the actual setup? So there are two, two ways this can be used. Now this is in, in one way is offline, right? I cannot see the students offline. Sure. So I'm actually the performer, right? I am imagining <laughs> students looking at me and I'm, I'm doing a performer. Think newscaster, think Mm -hmm. uh, a movie, a movie setting. So, but in the term, in terms of the student using it, they are engaging with me, my eyes, my my, they see me uh, engaging with the material. That's the key. Is how the okay. students are using it. That's one use case. The other use case is doing it in class. So, say for example, a student goes to a recitation section. There's a uh, there's a, actually I have my TA do some of these uh, lecture recordings, and there's a live um, light board. And you can see this. You can see the students through the light board. You can. Mm -hmm pass out from the light board. But the idea is I don't have my back to them while I'm writing, writing. Sure. That's just it. It's the, I guess in some ways, you know, it's imagining having, uh, having a conversation with the newscaster where the newscaster is actually not looking into the camera. It's just yeah. all wonky, all off. That's all that it is. Uh, but the, the, the sense of it's, it's uh, the, the fact that people are using it a lot. Um, well, let's say people, some, some people claim that it's valuable, suggests that there's something to it there. And again, it's just another tool. You know, if you think it's great, use it. Um, students often times give feedback that they really love it. Great. I'd like to well, add something just briefly. You know, so yeah. also like um, so again, I'm sure that we're not the only ones doing this. Like like the those movies I had, those were peer reviewed. I published those in 2018, mm -hmm. but like it's incorporating them now, for example, into the clinical PDFs. Like there's these, there's I'm sure there, so the, the idea of leveraging technologies and teaching, so many of us are doing that in different ways at different levels. And so we really um we I just want to emphasize that we're really interested in in community input and also learning and incorporating like other approaches that uh, other people have found useful. And so we're, so for the new products that we're producing, we're doing again, this internal review, but it would be great to have the community, like different com members of the community review. So if there's anyone out there that wants to grab something that we've used in a more formal way, it'd be great to do that. And we're happy to work with you because we'd like to get some of that more formal external review, as well as hearing from what worked for what you've done, you know, what, what someone else may have done. And we can incorporate that because in this new proposal that we want to write going going forward. And so um, I just wanted to sort of emphasize that we're really interested in sort of getting additional feedback and participation and leveraging what other folks have contributed as well in general. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that. I think that's, that's a great place to wrap up. And it reminds me that we'll make sure to um, put your contact info in the, in the comments section on this video, which will be up on YouTube. So for folks that are tuning in um, that want to get in touch with any of you or have questions or feedback, they can, they can make sure to do that.